room guard just shut down. There are surgeons ready and able to do the work. There are, goodness knows, there's a long list of patients who need access to these surgeries, and yet the funding model uh, doesn't uh, allow these surgeries <coughs> to come forward. So that is a, that's a, a big, big issue uh, in London particular, particularly, but also across the province. Uh, cuts to nursing is another big concern for uh, people in London and people in, in, around the province. Uh, we just, uh, my leader Andrew Horvath was here in London uh, last week. We met with the Ontario Nurses Association, who represents nurses at LHSC, and and uh, their uh, their data is showing that that over 1,500 nurses have been laid off in the province over the last uh, couple of years. And so this is having a huge impact on, on patient care. And we are hearing those stories in the constituency office as well. Um, the other, uh, the final big issue that I deal with uh, frequently is around, is around jobs. So we are seeing um, a, a decrease in the official unemployment rate for London and for the province. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, we're, we're also seeing a lot of people are, are just giving up. They're dropping out of the labor market. They're, they're not looking for work anymore. And so that, that artificially lowers the, the um, uh, unemployment rate. The, at, at the same time, we're seeing significant increase in, in food banks. This, the Ontario Association of Food Banks just released a report. Uh, I think it was last week or the week before. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that, that they highlighted was the fact that London has had an 11% increase in food bank use at the London Food Bank over the last year. Much of this is attributed to skyrocketing uh, hydro bills. And uh, so that is, uh, that is a, a big concern for, uh, for people in this community. You know, I have people calling, bringing in their hydro bills. Uh, their bills are, are doubling uh, or, or more over the last couple of years. Um, on an individual basis for people in, uh, in London, I deal a lot with issues around um, uh, Ontario Works, uh, Ontario Disability Support Program. These are provincial programs that are delivered by the city, which is another point of crossover between uh, the municipal councillor and the, uh, the provincial MPP. Uh, <coughs> we also deal with a lot of questions around um, identification, uh, so birth certificates, uh, OHIP cards, um, and uh, driver's licenses. So those would be sort of the, the top categories of, uh, of issues that we deal with in the constituency office. Okay. Okay. Is that question? Do you also go to housing for, uh, you know, for low income people that struggle with the law? Is housing an issue that you're... It's yeah. one of the crossovers, again, yeah, where the definitely. province pays for it, but the city um, administers it. So subsidized housing and the wait times, uh, affordable housing as well. Yeah, child care is another one of those kinds of issues that it's uh, the, the, the province uh, uh, sets the amounts uh, of funding that goes to municipalities, but it's delivered by the, by the, at the city level. So there's a number of, of uh, services like that that are uh, funded provincially and delivered uh, municipally. Because I think that's an issue too, isn't it? It's a huge issue. Because I think there's only one constituency rate for something I read in London. Yeah. There's about a 10 year wait The other thing that uh, that we've been doing at the provincial level through my through the NDP caucus, uh, one.
one of my colleagues, uh, Sherry DeNovo, who is a uh, Toronto uh, MPP, but she had been, she had introduced at least five private members bills on what's called inclusionary zoning. So this is a, this is a, a it allows municipalities to create bylaws so that um, if a developer wants to build a new development, then there has to be a set aside, a certain number of units have to be designated uh, affordable housing. And so uh, over the years, uh, the six years or so that Sherry DeNovo has been working on this issue and raising it at the legislature and pushing the government to move forward, uh, they finally did. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we should be, uh, should be seeing um, this is still in the implementation process is how this, this is going to work how it's going to roll out across the municipalities but uh, that it, it should make a difference in other other jurisdictions in the u.s other cities that have introduced inclusionary zoning it has really uh, had a had a very positive impact on increasing the number of affordable units that are available in the in the, uh, the city We do have a number of development and service organizations, um, such as, and this is taking me, <laughs> um, Community Living London, uh, who does a lot of uh, residential group homes for people with development yeah, disabilities. Yeah, we need to do accreditation for them, for all of them. And I want to thank Katie uh, Pelvis, who's for writing on our behalf to the ADA set, um, because they can come forward and right. start providing this to us. And, um, you know, we have also written letters to her privately as well and contacted people in um, community services. And um, nothing has happened yet, but I feel hopeful that in the future we will be talking to the Development Authority to learn how to write. And Did you? Very fast. Thank you very much for that. And this issue was also highlighted in the Auditor General's report last week uh, because it is, it's uh, a shameful the, the, the huge backlog of, of people who are waiting for access to these specialized uh, housing units. So. And I realize it's a huge uh, ocean of money that is needed, and I know that it's, um, it can go on and on and on, and um, I just want to make sure that we that we have that. Thank you. Um, and so I think people have seen a little bit of what's going on at, in London at City Hall. I think if I say what I've been working on for the past few months, it's staying out of the news um, and keeping a low profile, but doing the work on behalf of the community. Um, so a couple things uh, that I've done, it was one, um, the Municipal Act changes. So I spoke to council about uh, writing a letter of support for some specific changes in the Municipal Act. Um, and I know we're still in that process of looking at changes on how municipal, municipalities will be governed and uh, we'll be looking at it as a city and seeing which parts we support or don't support and which parts uh, we want to advocate for. So a specific one that I uh, had council support and I asked my colleagues to support was changes in the Municipal Act for parental leave. Um, so my kids are eight and nine. I felt like it was a very good thing for me to support because it wasn't about me per se, but it was about the principle of the matter. Right now there's no leave. Um, if someone were to have a baby or uh, be pregnant and need some time off in the municipal act. So you're still expected to continue <coughs> to do leave. Um, and I didn't think that was right. And I thought that really blocked a lot of young people from being interested. One of my colleagues had a, a baby last year, his spouse did. And again, there's no kind of provisions for any kind of time off. And uh, 
So the council unanimously supported that, and we sent a letter to Queen's Park um, of support for the changes to the Moose Park that would allow for some parental leave that could last to 16 weeks. Um, other things that uh, we've been doing, I talked a little bit about the Housing Development Corporation, which is kind of underway. We've got the board in place now. Uh, still working on rapid transit. We started to see some changes to the city, like the bus only lane that was uh, introduced in North West London. Um, and we just transitioned into our new committee. So I'm gonna be returning to the infrastructure committee, which is civic works committee uh, that started December 1st. So previously I've chaired other committees, uh, community <coughs> protective services and sat on corporate services, but I'm now doing the infrastructure committee and I'm chairing one of the water boards. The water boards, I don't think we talk about very much, but we do in London benefit from two separate water boards. Um, it is the Elgin primary water system and the Huron water system. So we get our water from both lakes. It's treated as a board member. I have a responsibility to make sure that Londoners are getting clean, healthy water and uh, taking care of that oversight. So I do that. Um, we have meetings every three months and I'm now chairing the Huron. Um, and so I want to take a moment to see kind of what is on your agenda, what kind of things might you like to talk about, and then I'll kind of go through them and we'll try and uh, bounce back and forth. Does anyone have anything specific that they want to talk about today? Um, the first one is London Hydro, and that's why I'm here. Okay. But also in the media, we heard about the pipelines, and I was not aware that there's one in Ontario. I don't know if that was the one of the ones that was the cruise. Okay. I think there are two. And I'm just wondering where it, if, if it's not the one that, if, it's, if it hasn't been approved, where exactly is it going to be or planned to be located? Okay. And what other, I guess I'm going to kind of make the list and then go through uh, it. So I have those two on. Anything else people want to talk about? Uh, yes. Um, we know the stadium on the uh, river there the power. So the, the river of got the power, they use the ideology of the, the socialists, which is the base of the NDP. I don't know why the NDP are so afraid to call themselves socialists, uh, which basically is their root ideology. And uh, even in America, that Mr. Trump used the same ideology to bring back the majority of the people to get the power. He's not going to do that, but he got the power now, and the river got the power in the same way. You spend more money, and you do this, and you do that, and then they will not do it, of course, but they got the power. I don't understand why the NDP have been involved in politics for, for so long. They don't stick to their own ideology. Why they don't have afraid of saying that they are socialists? Okay. Which, which, which is not the basic ideology of the NDP. I don't understand this. Yep, on list. We'll talk about that. Um, anything else? Okay. Uh, something for both of you um, is rapid transit uh, from London to Toronto. And how long is it going to take, or does GTA have first priority over the, ex the spending of the money first? As okay. we quickly. And the other one is changing the, as you were said earlier, about changing the municipal law. What about, uh, what's the length of time, not only in municipal law, but also in provincial law, and changing some of the existing laws that we do have now? For example, uh, DUI laws, can we make it stronger? Or, or you know, laws that are coming in that, you know, is it, is it gonna take two years to uh, make the DUI laws stricter, or does it take six months, or do you need, you know, uh, provincial approval? Something that you know we want to know how long is it going to take, so that we don't have to ask every month when is it going to come into effect. For sure. Anything else? Nicole, sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, a couple of things uh, for you personally. I saw that Councillor Kieber yesterday uh, advanced a proposal to cut the number of councillors and make them full time. Um, I'm sorry, I got here a few minutes late, so I don't know how you started the morning, so if I'm repeating anything, I apologize. But you did talk a little bit about uh, health care wait times 
in the province and um, is getting nursing care as well. And, I, I'm really, and I'm not really familiar with the NDP um, policy and platform, but I'm wondering what is, what is the party, what is your view on broad policy changes in order to boost and resolve the weight time issue in the province? Anything else, Mr. So what I'm going to do is kind of organize those as I go, and um, Peggy and I will take them. So I think we'll start with um, the hydro question, because I think that's one that we can both speak to. So do you want to put the question there? Well, I, I just want to know basically how, how, I mean, people don't want the privatization of London Hydro, and they don't seem to have any say, and I'm just wondering how it could be stopped. And it's up to the politicians, so I'm not saying that. So let's speak to London Hydro first, and then I think your question might be about Hydro One. So London Hydro is owned by the City of London, by the people of the City of London, and there's absolutely no discussion about selling that this time. So we will continue to own London Hydro, it continues to make us profits and revenue. Um, it's one of the few revenue tools that we have, so London Hydro will stay owned by the City of London. Hydro One is uh, the province, and I know that Peggy has uh, been working really hard on this, and I'll let you speak to it a little bit, Peggy, is that okay? Sure, and also with uh, with Hydro One, I think it was in 2012, uh, uh, the, the idea was floated of uh, selling Hydro One, and, and Londoners resoundingly uh, uh, you know, spoke up and said that they wanted uh, the local distribution uh, utility to remain in, in public hands. So, um, and we've just seen a similar um, uh, discussion uh, taking place in Toronto, and uh, Torontonians have also said that they want their, their local uh, uh, electrical distribution company to remain uh, publicly owned. So, so what we're seeing with the local utilities is um, there are some, some amalgamations uh, with the smaller uh, distribution companies joining together, uh, but, but generally uh, people want to see their local uh, utility remain publicly owned. Uh, on Hydro One, uh, right now the, uh, the province has sold off 30% uh, of the shares of Hydro One to the private sector. Um, this is something that uh, I think we're now up to about um, close to 300 municipalities have passed municipal resolutions opposing the, uh, the privatization of Hydro One. Uh, we know that, uh, that uh, uh, public opinion surveys have shown that, that 80, 85% I think of Ontarians are opposed to the sale of Hydro One. Uh, the Wynn government has, uh, has not shown any sign of backing down, although uh, the Premier in uh, a couple of weeks ago, she was speaking to uh, a Liberal uh, Party event and, uh, and she said uh, she apologized and said that, uh, that mistakes had been made. Uh, we're curious to know uh, what mistakes she thinks uh, she made, uh, but she, you know, that they're, they're sort of trying to throw things out there to address uh, uh, increasing hydro bills, but without addressing the privatization of hydro one. And, you know, when I talk to people, people understand that for a century, we had stable, we had a publicly owned system and we had stable uh, um, uh, prices for electricity. And then uh, under the former conservative government, when Mike Harris was in power, uh, they started the process of privatizing um, what was then called Ontario Hydro. And so they sold off the, the generation um, piece of, uh, of the hydro system to the private sector. And we're going to, to, uh, to sell off the transmission lines, uh, but there was, uh, you know, they realized that this was not politically um, uh, astute. There was a huge outcry, so they stopped there. Uh, now the Liberals have come in and have announced that they are proceeding to sell off the, the transmission lines, which is, uh, which is Hydro One. But the fact that they have, you know, they had the two, they had the two uh, IPOs, so they sold 15% chunk and then another 15% chunk. They've said that they're going to sell 60 up to 60%, uh, but they have stopped at the at the 30%. So, 
So we feel, those of us who have been involved in trying to fight this off, we feel that this has had uh, some, some impact because uh, the Liberals have, you know, the, we don't have any indication as to when or, or if the next, uh, the next tranche of shares is going to go on the market. Um, but people do see a connection between private, privatizing the utility and increasing hydro rates. People see that the government has yet to uh, to acknowledge that that is uh, you know that there is this uh, this connection between uh, you know, when you have uh, a privately owned utility profit becomes uh, the major uh, you know the, the the driving force behind uh, the operation of the utility and uh, and profit means increasing rates and. We have also seen within the electricity sector, we've also seen um, the government move forward with a Green Energy Act uh, that in many ways uh, also privatized the green energy sector. It, you know, the government signed these uh, very lucrative contracts with private sector uh, green energy producers, uh, which has resulted in Ontario having um, to, to sell surplus power at a huge loss uh, to the people of this province. So the, uh, the uh, financial accountability officer, who is the, sort of an independent officer of the legislature, has uh, issued a report, has pointed out to the government that the sell-off of Hydro One will result in a short-term cash uh, infusion just in time for the 2018 election uh, that can be used to pay down the deficit. But in the long term, uh, you know, it's going to cost the people of this province $500 million a year on an ongoing annual basis. And that's the loss of the, of the, the, the stable revenues that were generated uh, over the, the many decades by, uh, by uh, public ownership of the utility. But um, the best thing that people can do who are opposed to the, uh, to the sell-off is to, um, is to uh, you know, uh, there is a, a London chapter of, uh, of, a, of an organization called Keep Hydro Public. They're very active. You can go on, look on their website and, and they're doing a lot of things to raise awareness of, uh, of this issue. People are putting up lawn signs. Uh, people are signing petitions, which I am uh, every day. Uh, there are petitions presented in the legislature uh, stating people's opposition to the, to the sell-off of Hydro One. And then um, in London, we have Deb Matthews, the Deputy Premier, uh, who is part of that government that has made this decision. And uh, so we're encouraging everybody to contact Deb Matthews and let her know uh, that, uh, that you're opposed to the, to the privatization of, the, of, of Hydro One and the electricity system in the province. Um, okay, so so what I understand is that the, the production is actually private. Yes. So the finance are, are do you have does the government have access to the finances of the private of, of the private um of the utility? You can just pay taxes, right? They have they would have to pay taxes on their it's like what we're yeah. paying to those that are producing right. it so to the Right, so we're paying we're paying our hydro bills, but if the producer raises their like, are they regulated? Yeah, they're so regulated. They can't ra raise their rates to sell to the distributors, which are the, which is the government in this case, right? Currently, uh, but with the privatized <laughs> utility, the distribution will be sixty percent owned by the private. Right, owners. but because the the, the production. Is private. Yes. How the much generation. control do you actually have over the pricing that's coming in all the way down to us? There's significant. I mean, there's as the um, there's significant uh, um, control that the government would have over over uh, uh, prices. Uh, the, the, these contracts that have been signed with with private producers have been very much to the detriment of the people in this province. The gas plant being a perfect example. When you privatize uh, your electricity system, you're, you're at the mercy of the, of, of the, you know, the, the legal agreements that you sign with these private producers. 
So the governments had entered into a, a, a contract with these uh, private gas plants, and, uh, and then when the decision was made to relocate the gas plants, the financial penalty, the, the, the lost profits to that private owner meant uh, over a billion dollars to the Ontario taxpayer. But, uh, you know, there are ways that you can um, operate the electricity system that, that would not require uh, entering into these, uh, these private uh, sector uh, arrangements with, uh, with private owners. Of, and, and anyway, there, the, the contracts that are signed, when, as I mentioned with the green energy sector, we saw, we saw you know, green energy producers were being paid 80 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know we are we're having to to sell that we're having to to pay other jurisdictions to take the surplus el electricity that's being produced and and I don't in any way want to um, disparage green energy because the, you know this is this is our future we have to be uh, looking at, at sustainable uh, energy production but but handing it over to the private sector is not the way to go yeah. Um, Virginia, on the issue of London Hydro, I see that the free press just this morning has an article out that indicates that um, London Hydro seems to be in confidential merger talks with another entity, and the details of that I guess are confidential, and so we're not seeing who the negotiation, negotiations are with. Do you have any, any knowledge or comments about this? Um, I think there is uh, some confidential meetings on next week's agenda. Um, the problem with municipal governments that are public are about closed door meetings all the time, it creates a lot of concern. And sometimes closed door meetings are good, it gives us the ability to negotiate. An example would be, um, you know, if I was going to buy your house and I had to say in public on TV, I'm not paying a dollar more than X amount, well, the house now costs me X amount. Um, so those are the instances where we need to go into those private um, closed meetings to have those discussions to allow negotiations to happen to benefit Londoners. So I can't comment on anything that's on uh, the confidential agenda or anything that I learn in camera, uh, but I do expect that there would be public information available in the near future. I think London Hydro, um, owned by Londoners, it's prudent and it makes sense that they're looking for opportunities to continue to um, look at mergers and continue to increase revenues, and that's what we want them to do. Right, we want those shares coming back to the city of London to continue to be good and continue to allow us to reinvest in London. And the article does state that if, the mer if a merger were successful, there's the possibility that there would be local offices maintained in London. So I just don't, I think there's the possibility that in three years, if maybe, you know, London, London St. Mary's Hydro would head office in not that that's a terrible thing necessarily, but I think people should be aware that there's that possibility. Yeah, and always when there are questions <laughs> like that that you have in reading information in the public domain, um, as hard as it is, have trust that amongst your 15 representatives on council, myself one of them, we're asking those same questions in private session um, and trying to make the best decisions for the people that we represent. So, I think mergers are always on the table. I think that they could uh, benefit people London and I don't think that uh, anyone that I know on City Council would make a decision um, in regards to London Hydro in a way that would not benefit the City of London. I, I'm learning, right? I, I know the love keeps saying, oh, you're getting too political, Virginia. Two years ago, you just called it as you saw it. And now I, I know I have to be more careful in some of what I say. So, um, Okay, so I'm going to cover off a couple of the London things. There was a question about the high-speed uh, transit, and um, and I think we can both touch on this because we know that there's high-speed rail planned for London to Toronto. I think two years ago there was a 10-year timeline that was put on that, um, and so we know it's in the works. We know it's going to help to tie that. We also saw some media recently around. Um, a lot of Toronto or Torontonians buying real estate and living in London because of cost of living, um, housing prices being less. And I think when we look at how people work now, a lot of people are, you know, commuting into the office or working remotely, um, and maybe only need to go in one or two days a week. So 
We know that the high-speed rail is in the works. I think it's going to be a good thing for London um, and for our local economy when we look at housing uh, being purchased and people having kind of a better quality of life here in London than uh, what that same average house can buy you in Toronto if things go very far as I say. <laughs> so I think in London the average house is about 225000 and I think in Toronto that might get you a one-bedroom condo maybe. Uh, whereas here it gets you a nice uh, home with uh, space for family. So. Um, I just wanted to comment, I, I, I wish I had Virginia's confidence that it is in the works because uh, um, we saw this, uh, we saw this kind of just put out there during the last election um, as, a, as very much a, a, an election commitment, but we have not seen through the budget process, we have not seen what we feel are sufficient dollars allocated to make sure that this, uh, that this actually happens. Uh, I totally agree with Virginia. Uh, everybody in this, or, or the, the, the majority of people in this community, uh, see it as very much a game changer, very important to London's economic future. Um, but uh, but it, it will require significant resources uh, to make it happen. And uh, so that is one of the things that we're going to be, you know, holding the government to account on. You know, if they can't just throw this out there and uh, this, you know, shiny, shiny object uh, to get people to uh, to support them without actually uh, putting some meat on the bones and and actually delivering. So, uh, so that is uh, that is something that we are watching very, very closely because we know how important it is to the to the local municipality. One of the issues that. Um, we recently had a meeting, I guess it was about a month or so ago, there was a meeting, uh, a formal meeting at uh, the council chambers between city councillors and the local MPPs. So uh, Teresa Armstrong, who's the MPP for London Fanshawe, myself, Deb Matthews, MPP for, for London North Centre, and Jeff Yurick, who is MPP for uh, London uh, Middlesex, what is it? London, Middlesex Albany. Yeah, London Middlesex Albany. Anyway, the four of us met with the councillors, and one of the concerns uh, that I raised, and actually one of the one of the reasons why I felt this was such an important meeting to have, is that so much of the policy decisions that are made by the provincial government are driven by the GTA, and so uh, you know, the, the, especially with the current makeup of the of the the, the, the government. Uh, the, the governing party has has uh, a one lone liberal here in London uh, London North Centre, but basically uh, you know from from if you include KW as part of the GTA, all of the rest of southwestern Ontario uh, is is not part of the governing party. Most of northern Ontario is not part of the governing party. So there's a real concern that regional perspectives will be lost uh, when gov the government is making policy decisions and that's why it's so important to have ongoing and open dialogue between the municipality and and the locally elected MPPs regardless of what party we are because when we are uh, when we are uh, uh, bringing forward the concerns of the people we represent uh, to the provincial government we want to make sure that they're grounded in, in um, the work that the municipality is doing to uh, to um, leverage, uh, you know, provincial investments and uh, and uh, uh, make good policy decisions that are going to benefit uh, all of the people of the province, not just the GTA. Thanks so much, Adam. Yeah, you answered my question. Okay. GTA. Yes, and I did have that, and I, I think that's a common perception of people who watch politics and uh, pay attention is that. There's disproportionate amounts invested in the GTA or impacting the GTA than London. And I know London City Council has been consistent at saying, you know, we deserve our share as well. It's not, you know, in St. Michael's Fair, it's not that everyone gets the same, but that everyone gets what they need. Well, London also has needs, and I think City Council is pushing hard on making sure that we're being heard for those needs. Yeah, and there, the government, uh, there was recent legislation passed <laughs> about the number of ridings that are going to be um, uh, across the province in the in the June 18 provincial election, and uh, I think 15 new ridings were added to the GTA. Uh, so 
you know, there there is a possibility that a government could get elected uh, solely with uh, GTA seats, uh, which is a is a real concern for people who don't live in the GTA because you want to make sure that the policies uh, apply uh, fairly throughout the province. Okay, there's a, a question about a news piece recently. Uh, Councillor Hubert has sent a letter to City Council um, requesting that we look at the composition of Council of Ward Boundaries. Um, I believe it also addresses uh, re remuneration, or remuneration for councillors and um, responsibilities. Um, and that came from over here. And so I think the question was just for me to react to that if I'm correct. Um, I'm actually meeting with CTD London right after this meeting to do the same thing on the news tonight. Um, so my initial reaction to the letter from my colleague is that we're a little bit too um, soon on this. And the reason I say that is because about 18 months ago, we had a number of meetings that looked at council compensation, the work that we do, the farming job as a city councillor, and we asked the public and we asked the committee of people to do some work on our behalf and report back. They're coming back to us next month. So for me, uh, for council to say, you know, the letter kind of says, scrap that, take a right turn and start doing this instead. I think we need to wait. The committee's worked for over 12 months on this report back to council saying, you know, what is your job? What should it look like? What should you uh, be paid for doing that job? And what does the community expect from you? We need to get that information first before we start looking at deviations. And if we get that information back and we say, okay, we still think we need to look at changing it based on that information, that's great. But I committed, um, I committed in council, I've committed to the community that when we ask this community uh, movement, the Council Compensation Task Force, to do this work, to look at our role, to tell us what our job should be and what we should be paid for that job, I've already said I will accept what their recommendation is and I have no idea what that is. I have stayed out of the process, I have not um, attended meetings, I've not made inquiries about it. Uh, but to me, it's a reflection of the community. They're doing public engagements. They're talking to people in the community to say, what do you think? Uh, for me, the best thing for council to do is to say whatever the community decides is what I'll accept. So that's what I've committed to. That's what I'll be doing in January. I'm committing to it now. It's going on the internet, so I'll stay there forever. Um, and I hope that my colleagues will as well because we ask the community to do this work for us. I think at that point, if there are things that we still want to look at, such as the size of council or the ward boundaries, um, then I think that's when we need to take that step. But I think we need to see this work through, and I think that you know taking a, a detour right now would be really, really disrespectful to people who work for 12 months as volunteers on behalf of the city doing this work. So I hope that answers the question. I don't know if there's any other pieces to that. Um, Okay, uh, there was a question, there was a couple around how long it takes to change law, provincial law, policy changes. Um, so I'll start on um, municipal, and it, it's, I think it's gonna be similar for Peggy. I think it's really the will of your colleagues. It is really about the um, convincing the majority. So there's been times where I've wanted to make changes and it can happen really quickly. Um, and by that, with government, I would say inside of three to four months, because I say, hey, we should do this. Everyone agrees, you know, legal goes, they write up the bylaw, they bring that back to us, we say, yep, this looks good, we pass it and it's implemented. There's other times that we deal with the same issues over and over and over again um, for years, potentially. And a recent example would be the licensing changes. So um, you may have heard things in the news, maybe about like Uber or taxi. <laughs> That bylaw has actually been in the works for well over 12 months. I was, I was vice chair on the committee when we started discussing these changes um, and I chaired the committee for 12 months. I'm now off the committee and it's still not quite done, uh, but expect it back in the new year. So policies that require a lot of engagement of the public and um, that require significant changes will take longer. And if the will of the government is not there, um, it's harder. And so I'm not going to steal Peggy's thunder, but I know she has a couple of private member bills that she's really been successful at convincing the government, which is not her party, to support and start pushing them through. But I think sometimes it's a lot harder um, to push through those private member bills um, when you're not the governing party. Mm -hmm. Do you want to speak about from a provincial point? Yeah, sure. So, um, 
So sometimes change can be breathtakingly fast, and I'll give you an example. Um, and, and, but when that happens, it tends to be very anti-democratic because there is not sufficient time for uh, debate and engagement uh, of citizens. But last, uh, last third, I think, I think it was uh, the week before, we sit in Parliament or in the provincial legislature four days a week, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And so um, I think it was on the Wednesday, a week ago Wednesday, the government brought in Bill 70, which was an omnibus bill. It had uh, amendments. I think there was something like close to 30 pieces of legislation that were amended. There were 26 schedules to this bill. Uh, there was a, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, of significant uh, changes, some less significant, but, but the problem is that they, they dropped this on us. Uh, they rushed it through because uh, as a majority government, they know that they, you know, they can do this. Uh, we had the vote on it on um, Thursday. We voted at, um, I don't know, uh, it was close to noon. We voted at about 10 minutes to noon. At two o'clock, it was at committee. And so there's supposed to be an opportunity, once legislation is passed, second reading, then it goes to committee for public input, you know, you're, there's supposed to be advertising so that anybody, any organization or individual who has, a, who has an opinion on the legislation has an opportunity to request to be on the, you know, to, to make a deputation to the committee or to write a letter to the committee. Anyway, this bill, passed, uh, you know, it was about noon, and then two hours later, it's at committee, which is, you know, extraordinary, and it is very troubling. It's very anti-democratic when things like that happen. Um, but, but in every piece of legislation that is passed by the province has, uh, has a, uh, a sort of an effective date. So the date when the legislation will, will take effect. Sometimes that is left blank, and so it's that that can it's up to the government uh, to declare when the when the legislation takes effect. Uh, but most pieces of legislation do have the date uh, when the legislation will take effect, and and it can it can vary widely as to uh, as to uh, when it would take effect. But but the process of a bill becoming law is it's introduced and it's printed. Uh, and then it is uh, brought forward for a second reading, uh, and that's when there's a debate on principle uh, within the legislature. And then if it passes second reading, it goes to committee, as I mentioned, for public input. And then the committee, based on the input that's received, uh, goes through the bill clause by clause and, and makes amendments based on, on what was uh, heard during the committee process. And then the bill, as amended, goes back to the legislature for third reading. And then if it passes third reading, then it gets royal assent. And then the, the bill will have a, a date at which it becomes effective. But one of the other uh, really disturbing things that we have seen in the provincial legislature recently is um, the, through the committee process, oftentimes there will be a long list of people who come to committee who have all kinds of ideas about changes that need to be made, and the government has a majority of members on the committee as well, and the government will just uh, send the, the bill back to the legislature with no amendments, no changes made, no response to the input that was heard during the committee. So, uh, so these are some of the, some of the um, issues that arise when you have a majority government that isn't interested in, in listening to, uh, to uh, citizens and organizations who have ideas about, about uh, you know, the, how the legislation will affect them. Virginia mentioned uh, private members' bills. This is a, there's other legislation that individual members can introduce, uh, so these are not government bills. And I have uh, two pieces of uh, legislation that are currently going through the process. Uh, one is called uh, Protecting Interns and Creating a Learning Economy Act. And uh, the purpose of that bill is to expand co-ops and internships and field placements, those kinds of programs in post-secondary institutions, so in colleges and universities. 
and it also includes some changes to the Employment Standards Act to prevent the exploitation of uh, graduates who leave uh, college or university and are asked to work for free. We see this, uh, you know, this is far too common. Kijiji, uh, Craigslist, they, you see job postings that say, you know, that, that call these call this a job and then it says this is an unpaid employment opportunity and uh, the, 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 a, a reference will be provided. And my feeling is that a lot of young people feel they have no choice but to take an unpaid work uh, opportunity because they want to get some relevant experience because they haven't had the relevant experience through a co-op or an internship or a field placement while they were at school. And then they, uh, they don't want to report their so-called employer, who's not paying them, uh, because they don't want to be, uh, you know, they don't want to be blacklisted, or they don't want to have uh, this this carry after them uh, that that they reported an employer who wasn't compensating them. So it really creates a, a a huge pressure for these graduates who are trying to get their first job in the workforce. So that's my one bill, and that had public input. Uh, and all of the people who came to committee to speak to it supported the bill. Uh, but at this point, the Liberals haven't given any sign as to what, uh, what is next for that uh, piece of legislation. And then my other bill is, uh, is to amend the Employment Standards Act to provide up to 10 days of paid leave for employees who have experienced domestic violence or sexual violence. Uh, and, uh, and that bill uh, passed second reading with unanimous support from all three parties in the legislature. It's been referred to a committee, but it has not yet been scheduled for uh, committee hearings. But I'm, I'm uh, getting some signs from the government that the government is thinking of taking that bill and introducing it as government legislation, mm -hmm. which from my perspective would be fine because I just think that this is an important policy change and whether it happens because of my bill or a government bill doesn't matter to me. I would just like to see it uh, happen. So that, is that gonna take another year? I don't know. I'm ho the, the government is, is engaged for the last year. They've been doing uh, a major, uh, they call it the Changing Workplaces Review, looking at all kinds of issues around Employment Standards Act and the Labor Relations Act. And so they are, they are supposed to be announcing um, some legislative change that's associated with this Changing Workplaces Review. This could be uh, included as part of the government's package of amendments that, that would be made, uh, or it could move forward on a, as, on a standalone basis. But I'm hoping that it will happen soon. We've seen other jurisdictions, Manitoba has already made these changes. There's a, a number of US states that already have this kind of, uh, these kind of supports in place. So, uh, so I'm hoping that uh, that it will move forward. I should say that the um, the purpose of the leave that would be provided is, uh, is is spelled out in the bill. So the leave can only be used for five specific reasons: uh, to uh, to access medical uh, treatment, uh, to see a, a counselor at a you know a rape crisis center or a women's shelter, uh, to uh, to get psychological uh, support. Uh, to uh, to relocate, oftentimes in domestic violence, uh, you know, uh, a woman and her children have to flee and find somewhere else to live. Uh, and the fifth purpose is to deal with the police or the courts or the justice system to uh, to follow a case through. So so the the it's not sort of wide open leave, uh, but it says that uh, that an employee can take up to ten days uh, un or ten days paid leave uh, for one of those. Uh, for those five purposes. Okay, the last two items I have, and I'll put them out there now and let people think if there's anything they want to add. Uh, one was on local pipeline um, in relation to, I think, Standing Rock um, and where the local one is. I don't know. I don't, I'm hoping Peggy might have some more information, but she may not as well. Um, I do know that the Chippewa Towns First Nations have been um, advocating um, for this and that there's some concerns they have with treaty rights and consents. The other one, um, and I think again it's a Peggy one, and it's talking about kind of ideology and politics, the difference between uh, socialism, um, the NDP, Liberal Party, and kind of in with that lens of global politics. 
So do you want to cover off those two? Yeah, I don't know very much about uh, the, the, the policy details of line nine. There is a, a proposed pipeline that would uh, go through uh, southwestern Ontario, uh, but that would be a federal decision and that, that's not an issue that the provincial legislature is dealing with right now. And I, uh, so I, I apologize, but I can't, uh, I can't speak to that issue. And what's it called, line nine? Line nine, yeah, line nine. Um, the, uh, the issue around uh, what the NDP stands for, you know, I think that people get caught up in labels. Uh, so the NDP has historically been, will continue to be a uh, social democratic party. Uh, that is our, uh, that's our sort of our underlying philosophy. But really <laughs> what that means is that everybody deserves a shot. So we want to make sure that, that uh, the programs and services that are in place, that the decisions that government makes enables everyone to uh, live a good life, you know, to raise a family, to buy a house, uh, to uh, to take a vacation, uh, you know, to be respected at work, to 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 find work, uh, to get access to the medical uh, uh, support that they need. Um, it, it's just it's it's grounded in this philosophy that, that everyone uh, deserves a, a, a basic quality of life and that government has a responsibility to, uh, to address that. Um, there was, uh, you know, I know that there was some, some uh, cr criticisms raised about the NDP in the last provincial election. Uh, the, you know, people felt that the platform wasn't clear enough in terms of the principles that, uh, that we believe in. Uh, but you, you'll see uh, quite a difference in the uh, in the next election. We've made a commitment to a $15 minimum wage. Uh, if the NDP forms government, uh, we have uh, the other question about healthcare wait times. We've made a commitment to um, to ensuring that uh, that hospitals are funded uh, at that that hospital budgets increase uh, at a minimum by cost of living on an annual basis and that uh, hospital funding takes into account uh, population change and demographic change as we see, uh, as we see uh, you know, an aging population and, and increasing complexity of, uh, of healthcare needs. Uh, we, have, uh, we have made a, a number of commitments already, but you'll be seeing uh, many more commitments uh, coming forward as we, as we move closer to the 2018 uh, election, but yeah, I, you know, the, sometimes the the ideology uh, uh, shifts, and sometimes it's hard to know uh, who's right and who's left. And and the uh, the typical thing that people say about liberals is they campaign from the left and they govern from the right. We now see uh, a progressive conservative party that is uh, is now saying they're opposed to privatization. Uh, they're opposed to the privatization of Hydro One. Quite honestly, it's it's hard to take that seriously because you look at their record of what conservatives do when they are elected, and they are huge supporters of privatization. They privatized the 407 Highway 407, and if there is any example of what privatization means for people, uh, just look at the 407. We have a private sector owner that is just raking in profits from the tolls that are charged on that highway. Uh, and the Conservatives, as I mentioned, had started the process of privatizing the electricity sector. So, you know, the, there's shifts during, especially during election campaigns as parties are positioning to run, uh, but you look at you look at their track record and the kinds of uh, consistent values that that uh, that parties have always um, represented, and the NDP has always spoken up for you know working people, for families, uh, for everyone to get a to get a fair shot in the province. Well, we, we know that the people want a lot of access to my experience. Uh, some things that you probably would have said in the end of the government had to do major areas of hospital or assistance or screening or yeah. I mean, and there's, we know that that is a benefit for everyone. Yeah. And I know from when when we used to vote uh, what the problem in the province and we promised to privatize insurance, we turned around and said, no, we're not going to do that. And well, we lost a lot of support just on that one thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so since the benefit of everything that is social is quite obvious, 
is why MVP is so so conservative in, in not, not saying these things, not no, not saying loud his policy. Mm -hmm. We have to do things socially. Yeah, the labels don't. From my perspective, like the NDP is a social democratic party. There's no question. The, people don't. The, the labels are not what people care about. People care about what the party is going to do, what their track record shows that uh, you know they have the issues that they have fought for uh, over many years, and so. Uh, you know, I, I don't I don't I don't agree with you uh, that the NDP has been uh, has been t timid in that way. I think we it's always been very clear that uh, that we believe uh, we believe in uh, unionization. We believe in supporting uh, families. We believe in uh, in uh, uh, good jobs that benefit everybody. We have pushed for uh, a cap on CEO salaries. We're the ones who've been raising that. Uh, um, consistently in the legislature because we see, you know, we see this increasing gap between the wealthiest people in this province are, are earning more and more as, as, as you know, services are privatized, uh, uh, co executives are getting these, uh, these crazy salaries. Um, so we have, you know, we believe that, that uh, a, a good society requires, um, requires uh, that gap to be narrowed that everybody should be, everybody deserves to have uh, uh, equal opportunities. Yeah, they, they, they only talk the three major parties use the same analogy, the same words that you just said. Yeah, they There's do. There's no difference between good and have, good and have not. But when it comes to the actual doing government, government of the state department, it's, it, it's just, just about base. Now we have, I'm just gonna give you the example of the NDP, the power, Privatize the, the insurance industry, they just turn around. So, what I'm saying is, why don't one speak to that precise point that I'm saying? While you are, you know, it seems like you, well, you admit that you are trying to say that you are socialist. What's so, the socialist? No, is I everything that we do that we, we <laughs> care about is socialist. Yeah. I'll take this feedback back to uh, to our caucus. I, I appreciate what you're saying. I don't agree that we have, uh, that we are. You know, trying to pretend that we're not uh, a democratic socialist party. That's always been, that's in our DNA. That's always been what we stand for. And that's, uh, that's clear to people, I think, when they look at our platform. Uh, but I did want to go back to the, uh, the uh, healthcare wait times issue. I mentioned that uh, the commitment that has been made to, um, to uh, uh, ensure that hospital funding keeps up with, uh, at a minimum, with the rate of inflation. What we saw under the Liberals was uh, was uh, four consecutive years of budget freezes for hospitals at the same time that uh, that there were you know over two percent increases in cost of living. Uh, hospitals were forced to try to do everything they could to to, to make up that shortfall. Uh, in this last budget, uh, in the 2016 budget, the Liberals announced a one percent increase to hospital budgets. Uh, which you know that that's welcome, but it come it it doesn't even address the 2016 cost of living increase, uh, much less make up for that uh, for that the uh, uh, increasing um, financial pressures that were created by these uh, four consecutive years of budget freezes. So um, this is this is uh, one of the reasons for the the wait times because uh, the the funding is delivered so that there is a cap on the number of surgeries that hospitals can perform uh, and uh, and that means that the surgeries are spread out regardless of how many people need surgery uh, and that has created these uh, these uh, unacceptable absolutely unacceptable wait times of, uh, of you know in some cases I'm hearing two years two years people are waiting in uh, in in serious pain Unable to to uh, um, uh, you know engage in their in uh, their everyday activities, uh, uh, their prescribed uh, painkillers as a way of, of dealing with this uh, with the weights. Oftentimes, 
that they're, that they, they're at much higher risk of falling, so that when they finally do get the surgery, their, their health is even more compromised than it would have been if they had been able to get the surgeries uh, faster. So, so uh, uh, budgets are a big part of, uh, of addressing the wait times. The other thing the NDP has committed to is a moratorium on any further cuts to, uh, to nurses. So RNs, RPNs, and, uh, and nurse practitioners. Uh, which is another, it's another um, huge piece of the uh, of the healthcare puzzle. Uh, all of the research shows that that uh, uh, the, the 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 better the uh, the nurse to patient ratio, the uh, lower the nurse to patient race ratio, the better uh, patient outcomes. Uh, so so cutting nursing staff is uh, is not the way to go. You know, we also see that acute care, uh, hospital care is, you know, the healthcare system is like a three-legged stool. You need acute care, you need community care, uh, and you need um, you need uh, uh, emergency care. So you can you can't have uh, you have to ensure that all three of those of those uh, uh, components are are operating. Um, you know, are, are funded appropriately. We've seen this government has said that they're making these investments in community care, which is why they're justifying the decreases in hospital care. We're not seeing uh, uh, better care delivered at the community level. And we are seeing uh, uh, increasing wait times for hospital care because people can't get access to community care. So, so you can't deal with just one piece of the healthcare system, you have to deal with all of them. Vic, one more question, and then I'm gonna do a quick wrap up, and yeah. Peggy and I will stay available to answer. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the, you know, the freeze on, on uh, cutting back on nurses. What they've done though, what the provincial government has done, is taken uh, replacing RN, registered nurses, with RPNs, so therefore lowering the wages. But, not, but are, you, are you compromising the healthcare Professional healthcare and knowledge of a registered nurse as, as compared to an RPN. So you're sort of, government sort of hiding the fact that, oh yeah, we're not cutting back on nurses, but as soon as the registered nurses retire, they get replaced by an RPN. <laughs> uh, that is an issue that uh, that uh, uh, the, the Registered Nurses Association is, it in particular has, has highlighted. I hear a lot from uh, any number of, uh, of healthcare professionals uh, who are regulated by, the, I think there's 27 categories of regulated healthcare professionals, and, and uh, many of them come and say, if they could only work to their scope, you know, uh, it would be so much better uh, within the system. So it, it almost feels like there's this big jigsaw puzzle and the pieces aren't aligning properly. And if you could, if you could um, ensure that all of the regulated health professionals are actually working to their scope, because there's an important role for RPNs. There's no question RPNs are, are a, a, a critical piece of the healthcare system, but so are RNs, so are nurse practitioners. There's a, an issue right now about uh, the scope of nurse practitioners. There's issues around um, uh, scope of practice for, for audiologists. They're allowed to prescribe hearing aids, but they're not allowed to diagnose, which is crazy. And it's, uh, you know, the, some, of these, some of these changes in scope would also, sorry, not even changes of scope, just allowing healthcare professionals to work within their scope uh, would alleviate uh, some of the pressures that build up in other parts of the healthcare system. Could I just, just share one thing before we wrap? Um, just a comment. Um, I just recently finished reading the book, The Nordic Theory of Everything. Ah, uh, yeah, it's and fantastic. It is, and it's written by a Finnish woman who's living, who married someone out of love in the United States. But she, she discusses the reasons why the five Nordic countries, according to the UN, have the best quality of life uh, from a UN perspective. And when you look at the social and governmental policies in Sweden, Norway, Finland, the government that most closely aligns with those social government policies is the NDP. And that's what I read, I read that. So I was, if you, if you get a chance and you read, please read that book, because it, we also have more women in Parliament than men. Yes, they do. Peggy, <laughs> you 
you've read that book? Yeah. Yeah. Would you agree with that comment? Maybe you should run for the NDC leadership. Nordic yeah. Party or Nordic <laughs> Democratic Party. But would you agree with that comment that a lot of the social government platform, the way they do it, is aligned with the NDP? That's the way I. That's no, I, and, and to the point that was raised earlier, I mean, the NDP is a social democratic yeah, party. Which and, is uh, yeah, and that is uh, the, the Finnish model, the, the Scandinavian countries yeah. are. Are, uh, you know, they share the, a similar ideology of social democracy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought that that was an excellent book as well. I was really happy to find it. So I think I'm gonna wrap up just by saying, you know, I will do this meeting again in about three months time and I'll do the same advertising through my website, through my newsletter, and I typically put a sign up at one of the land commissioners um, to kind of point people to the location. I look for suggestions from the community about what do you want at these meetings. I'm happy to do this style and continue. This has been um, popular the last few meetings, but sometimes if there's a specific issue, I'll bring someone in to speak to that issue. The other thing that I try to use these meetings for is feedback, and I have no delusions that um, anyone in my community agrees with 100% of what I do all the time. Um, so I know this forum, it might be awkward to do that, but if you have concerns about what I'm doing or you think I'm not doing something I should be doing, please email me, please call me. I look for that, I want that feedback. You're not insulting me, you're not upsetting me. I can't represent you if I don't hear from you. But not just about you know what you support, but about what you don't support, because that's gonna shape how I represent you um, at City Hall, and I want to continue doing that. I really enjoy doing that, so please give that feedback. Um, a couple of hands went up, yep. Yeah, the only thing I, I would like to point out is that I got the email yesterday, and I know that in your previous uh, newsletters that you were thinking about having Peggy Sackler come and speak to us, but we only got the email yesterday, so if we could get a little bit earlier notice, that would be helpful, thank you. Right, I'm gonna try and book for the middle of the month, because my newsletter always comes out the very end of the month so I think with this being the third it did not leave a lot of time uh, but we'll try and book these meetings for the middle of the month which should give you two weeks notice thank you yeah, just great that both of you you know are meeting here today it just makes it easier for us to instead of going to two separate meetings just to meet once but if you can do an itinerary ahead of time that would even be better you know try and combine questions together ahead of time and that way I don't have to get up in the middle of the night <laughs> I did get your email though, and I got back to you when I got up, which was not the And she forwarded it right to me, so I got it. Oh, do I, I actually, I misspoke. I, uh, I realized when I was talking about the three-legged stool of the healthcare system, the three legs are uh, mm -hmm. uh, acute care, community care, and primary care. Primary care is the third leg, so that's access to a family doctor. And we are actually hearing, this is another issue that I deal with in my constituency office, uh, there is, London is becoming an underserved community where we have, uh, you know, people are having difficulty finding a, a family doctor. And if you don't have access to a family doctor or a nurse practitioner, uh, that is, uh, that is a, a huge challenge for the healthcare system as well because that is where some of these, uh, you know, the, 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 the issues that, that become problems later on, uh, early intervention can help deal with those uh, right then. So, uh, so you need to have um, you need to have a well-functioning primary care system, community care system, and uh, and acute care or hospital uh, system. All three of those pieces have to be working uh, in concert. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And like I said, Peggy and I will stay here. So please come on up and have a chat. And uh, we'll see you again in three months, if not.